who doesn't know our special guest, the amazing Dr. Deepak Chopra. I couldn't be more thrilled to be having this conversation with him. But for the few of you who don't have an iota of an idea, which I can't believe, who Dr. Deepak Chopra is, let me see if I can do due diligence. Dr. Chopra is the founder of the Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit entity for research on well being and humanitarianism. He's also the founder of Chopra Global, a whole health company at the intersection of science and spirituality. He's a pioneer, a pioneer of integrative medicine and author of over, get this, 90 books. Have you even read 90 books? <laughs> So he's been the author of over 90 books published in more than 43 languages. Many of them have been actually New York Times bestsellers, both in fiction and nonfiction. Deepak, it's a great pleasure to have you joining us today. You. Om Shanti, warm welcome. Om Shanti. Om Shanti, thank you for having me. You know, I like my conversations to be very intimate, very real, very natural. And before getting with you on air, I was thinking, how do you spend your day knowing what you know and not saying that you have felt everything that you know, but how do you spend your day knowing what you know? Right now, um, you know, I try to go to bed between 8 and 10 at night um, uh, and sleep 8 hours. I do yoga nidra before I go to sleep. I meditate on my physical death before I sleep. I ask questions about reality before I sleep. In the morning, I download some of the answers I get. Uh, first thing is that's what I do. I make notes. And then I you know, do my rituals and from basically six to 11, I usually don't do anything except yoga and meditation and uh, reflect on whatever I've heard at night from somewhere. And then after 11, I get busy doing what I'm doing right now. So after our conversation, I'll probably have a, another conversation. I ask myself only two things about what I'm about to do. Is it fun? Uh, are the people who I hang out with fun to be with? And Will it alleviate suffering in any way, even a little bit? Um, and then if the answer is yes to all these three, then I do it. Otherwise, I don't do it. I have um, no goals, no ambitions right now. And uh, so I'm, I'm pretty, I'm a happy camper. Uh. You know, when we think about the conditions of humanity right now, um, we're in this Kali Yuga stage where consciousness has reached this point, Deepak brother, as if we've just, we've, we've lost sight. We're in this, this sleep stage. We're in the sleep stage of just not witnessing or experiencing the depth of our beauty and divinity. And then you've got folks like you and so many others who are trying to share their own sacred realizations for perhaps the awakening of others, you know? What has been your thoughts about what you're witnessing in the world right now? What do we need to do? Do we need to do anything more, Deepak? Yeah, we do. I mean, you know, if you go through the um, tradition of yoga, then there is, and yoga means union, ultimate dharma, you know, finding out who you are. Uh, there's Raj Yoga. Uh, which is uh, the daily practice. There's bhakti yoga. The, what I think of bhakti yoga is love in action, not just love or devotion. Because without action, love is sentimentality. And uh, without, uh, uh, as I said, without action, love is sentimentality. And action without love is irrelevant. irrelevant. So I think of karma yoga as love in action. And I think it's very important that at this moment, we all kind of engage in what is called emergence. And social scientists are talking about emergence. They say when you have shared vision, so right now the shared vision would be collective awakening, a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, joyful world, shared vision. 
have maximum diversity in that shared vision. You have uh, complementing of emotional and spiritual bonds. You have total transparency and you have the right sankalpa. In this case, more peace, justice, social, economic, gender justice, sustainability, health of the planet, health of our cells because the biosphere inside and outside is the same. We call it the air, but it's our breath. We call it water, but it's our circulation. We call it earth, but it's uh, our recycled body. Uh, we call those stars, but atoms from there are recycling in my body. So the very word environment is alienating. Uh, we have a personal body. We have a universal body, there are. So, you, know, you put a rabbit in a vacuum, it dies. You put a plant in a vacuum, it dies. So you put them both together, they thrive. That's why this idea of planting a million trees is beautiful because it's the way to re-resurrect life on our planet, just not human life, but all life. And we can't think only in terms of human life. So love and action is, is the key right now. But so is personal transformation, because in the absence of personal transformation, you can't have social transformation or planetary transformation. It's all the same thing. So if we go with uh, the great Mahatma Gandhi's words, can you be the change you want to see in the world? Can we be the love that we want to see in the world? Can we be the peace that we want to see in the world? You know, Patanjali in the Yoga Sutra says in the absence in, in, when we are firmly established in ahimsa, which, by the way, is not only the first yama, but in the age of Kali Yuga, you mentioned, the great teacher said, that's the only thing you need to follow. The rest of the yamas and yamas. Are, and ahimsa is not really non-violence, it's peace presence. And, you know, when you're present to that presence, which is you, then all beings around you cease to feel hostility, not by what you say, not by what you do, but just by your presence. That's Patanjali saying that. And that's the experience of the great rishis, even the animals and the lions and tigers sit and they all rest in peace. So I believe in these traditions. I believe we are in Kali Yuga. I believe we have the opportunity to resurrect life on this planet. Whether it happens or not, it's the will of the divine. Uh, we can't assume personal agency at this moment. We can only act as if we have personal agency. It happens or not in our lifetime, it's got to happen, Deepak. There's no way we are putting in the effort that we are to not actually know one day we'll wake up and there will be a Satyugi culture. There will be a culture where no one's lacking no one's lacking love in their personality, in their sanskars, in their sankalp. Have you ever, have you ever woken up any mornings? I know I have, but then again, I'm Pisces. But <laughs> have you ever woken up any morning when you just felt this disillusionment with humanity? You know, we just got out of a tumultuous administration of leadership in the United States, and. It was such a um, toxic environment for the country and for the world. And there were some mornings, Deepak, I really felt a disillusionment to humanity despite the amount of energy and love that I've put in as seva, as service. I just felt a little low, like what is it that's going on? Have you ever had one of those moments? If so, how did you turn it around? Okay, I mean, I had those moments for many decades. It's not you know, just once, every decade where I felt that we are asleep and we are sleepwalking to extinction, that if we don't recognize the fact that uh, our behavior is insane collectively, then we are declaring our insanity. You mentioned a tumultuous presidency, but uh, you know, as I look across the world, I see every leader, political leader at least, is a gangster, except for a couple of you know uh, people like the woman in <laughs> New Zealand or 
you know, the, the prime minister of Ireland, but, you know, very difficult to find a leader that's not a gangster. And so, you know, I woke up well, like that many, many times until I realized, and that happened almost 10, 15 years ago, that's even not the point. You know, the point is everyone in the world is doing the best they can from the state of awareness they're in. And so, you know, every conditioned mind has its own reality, whether it's Hitler or Genghis Khan or, uh, you know, whoever, uh, Timur, uh, the lame Timur or whoever. So, you know, at that moment, when you realize that, you stop judging and you say, you know, everyone's doing the best they can from their level of consciousness. And this is not even condescending. It's just the fact. We are, you know, we're all evolving. Some as infants, some as adolescents, some as so-called mature adults. But, you know, that's all a personal opinion. So I, I stopped 10 years ago, maybe less than 10 years ago. You know, I used to engage with debates with people like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and militant atheists, for what? To make a point of view that I was right and they were wrong. I think right now, I don't. when I wake up in the morning, all I do is ask myself, how can I make this joyous? And how can I, if joy is not the measure of success, then there is no success. You begin with joy, end with joy, and leave the rest to God, leave everything else to the divine, let your body fulfill its karmic destiny, but trust the divine, I'm not doing anything right now to regulate, as I said, my blood pressure or anything, it's all happening. So let it happen with the right intention. So if I do have the right intention, the sankalpa, you know, which as you could put a gun in my um, on my head in my sleep and what do you want a more peaceful just sustainable healthier and joyful world can i do it through uh, angry activism no because then only you know even moral outrage is rage period so give up more moral outrage as well clash from some folks who feel that there are healthy forms of anger when they go out and do the marching and the activism. And I get it, I get it. Some, I think some souls are designed to do that. I might not be one of those, but I sometimes wonder, are they adding to that consciousness that we're trying to stop? You know, like you said, the moral outrage, to what extent is that helping us to return to a place of peace? The other day, Deepak, I was sitting with some youths, all under 16, and their parents, and we ended up having a conversation that I overheard in the car driving the other day. There was a young boy that said, atoms and molecules, they're not attached, and the soul in the body isn't attached. But then why is it that we live such an attaching existence? And we found ourselves moving towards the conversation of consciousness. You've been doing this all your life, and especially the last 40 years, you've been doing a lot of investigation, and what is this thing? What what is consciousness? Have you come to any latest discoveries as to what consciousness is? And I'll tell you, for me, I'm just walking right now for me. For me, consciousness is as much as I can be quiet inside, and I don't entertain waste or negative thinking. That's just where, I'm, where I am right now. It could change. But what is it for you? I mean, has it evolved for you, the interpretation of consciousness? Yes. So before I answer that, you know, the angry activists, it's okay to have anger and release it. But it's not okay to have hostility. Two different things. Okay, Anger, release of energy, and can be a useful release of energy. Hostility is the desire for vengeance, which creates... Uh, Inflammation actually is a risk factor for death. Sudden death from hostility is a risk factor. Anger is not. If you release the anger, move on. That's okay. Now, consciousness, what you described um, as uh, the quiet mind is the closest we can get to consciousness when we talk about samadhi, which means not only quiet mind, everything is quiet. Vrittis, you know, you read uh, Patanjali, second verse after he begins the first chapter now the yoga te or your teaching of yoga begins is 
uh, yoga is the quietening of the vrittis. Vrittis are sensations, sense perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts. So when you quieten them down, then you, what you end up with is what is called in the, our spiritual non-dual traditions, both uh, actually everywhere, Sufism and Hinduism and Buddhism and actually uh, the Kabbalah and everywhere else, the source of thought is the source of all experience, all experience. Sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts by themselves are just sensations. That's all they are. When you look at the world, all you see is color. Uh, when you call it uh, an iPhone or a hand or uh, a T-shirt, that's a human construct. What you see is color, shapes, and forms, period. No, no baby would be able to tell you that's an iPhone. So normal experience is only sensations. One word, sensation, sense perceptions, images, feelings, thoughts. When we quieten that, then we are in the source of all experience, including that which we call atoms and molecules. You know, atoms and molecules are not real entities. They are names given to perceptual modes that humans have. You know, no alligator will be able to tell you that's an atom or a molecule, okay? What does the world look like to an insect with a hundred eyes? Uh, what is it like to be a bat? Irrelevant questions. What we call the physical world is just, you know, it's a made up concept made by humans by giving names. You know, we know Nam Roop. As soon as you give a name, you reify an experience that's happening in you. So when people die, the soul doesn't leave the body, the body leaves the soul. The soul has nowhere to go. It's non-local, it's not in space-time. So, you know, we have all these concepts. My body, I'm going to die, my soul will leave the body, I will leave the world, when in fact the world and the body and the mind are a modified form of consciousness. So now what is the deeper notion of consciousness? It's the only reality. Now, if you look at uh, today, philosophical traditions, there are three dominant worldviews right now, three dominant worldviews. The first let's get rid of immediately, which is called dualism with Descartes, mind and body. I think, therefore I am. Well, he was absolutely wrong. It's the other way around. I am, therefore I think. How can you think if you don't exist? Okay, so that's number one. Dualism is out, and dualism doesn't, doesn't explain any experience, including lifting my hand. It starts with a thought which is not material, and it ends with this, which is very physical. So dualism also violates the laws of thermodynamics. And another discussion, we don't need to go there, but there's no such thing as mind and matter interacting because we don't even know what the agent of interaction is. Dualism is also the two dominant theories are, one is called physicalism, which is 99.9% .9 of science today is based on physicalism. What is the problem with physicalism? Three problems. Number one, subject-object split. It's me and what I'm looking at. Number two, the assumption that matter is real when in fact it's a perceptual activity. And number three, there's an embodied observer, a soul, not true. The, the, the body itself is an experience in the soul. So, you know, the world is in my awareness, the body is in my awareness, and the mind is in my awareness, and all those are temporary fluctuations in time, but the awareness, which is formless and timeless, is not in time. It's not subject to birth and death. You ask these great wishes, what happens to me after I die? They say, well, I was never born, you know? So those are questions that we need to not only intellectually understand, but at the level of experience. So what is consciousness? Here are the best definitions of consciousness that I've heard. They're not mine, okay? So number one, consciousness is the knowing element in every experience. So right now I know I'm having this experience, okay? Um, so that's a good definition. Number two, consciousness is that in which all experience occurs. Where's this experience occurring? Not in my brain. There's no sound in the brain. There are no colors in the brain. There's no image in the brain. If I ask you to think of the Milky Way galaxy or a rainbow or a rose or your mother, you will have some experience 
all I'll see in the brain is electrochemistry. So, you know, where's experiencing occurring in consciousness? All experience occurs in consciousness. All experience is known in consciousness. All experience is made out of consciousness. And there is nothing we know other than experience. So all there is is consciousness. Now, if you were religious, you would say there is only God. But these days, it's kind of, you know, I can't say that at Harvard Medical School or the next Science and Consciousness Conference. I can't say all there is is God and that we are souls that are differentiated from God just in the way your body organs are differentiated from one cell, pluripotential stem cell. It can become eyes, nose, this, that, the other. And this is not separation, this is differentiation. So is the whole universe differentiated from the divine as knowers, modes of knowing and things known, and not just human knowers and human knowing and human things known. All sentient beings are producing a universe right now. We literally are in an infinite multi-dimensional universe. And of course, spiritual traditions call these lokas, but you know, Lokas are not locations in space-time. They're frequency domains in consciousness. If you now read some of the brilliant scientists who are writing books, who are physicalists, by the way, they're saying we are living in an infinite universe. There are infinite dimensions of us. There are infinite planets. There are at least 2 trillion galaxies we know of, 700 sextillion stars, uncountable trillions of habitable planets, 40 billion habitable planets just in the Milky Way galaxy. That is so mind boggling that you have to surrender to mystery. And that is what the Yoga Sutras call Ishwar Pranidhana, that you surrender to the divine. There's no mystery to be solved. You just have to surrender to that mystery. And we do, you'll have peace and joy and equanimity and you'll be done. Now, once you're done with that, then go be an activist and you know, have fun changing the world to the extent you can. Especially if you're in your 20s. <laughs> yeah, especially in your 20s, that's right. Is there an end game? Is there an end game to enlightenment or spirituality? I'll tell you the last year and a half of being in the pandemic, you know how we were so busy traveling, going here, going there, and now we're traveling on Zoom every day. But I'll tell you this, Deepak, it's like, I just, I'm just having this deep insatiable pull to, to explore the soul of Jenna even more and to love it and to fly with it and to soar with it, whatever it's going to be. But I used to think like the end game of spirituality is I would be so perfect, I would never get angry. Everything around me would work absolutely perfect. Uh, this would be like that, that would be like that. I don't feel that anymore. But is there an end game to your interpretation of spirituality <laughs> or enlightenment? Uh, yeah, I, I do think that there's no end game, but I also don't use the word game. It's a play. So you see in the game, you're all like the Olympics, so you're competing, okay? Who gets the soul, gold medal, who gets the silver medal? That's a game, but a play is not like that. You know, go to a nice Shakespearean play, you know, there's Caesar, there's Mark Antony, there's the betrayer, there's the adulterer, there's the victim, there's the hero. And at the end of it, they all come and bow and take a, you know, they were all playing a game, so to speak. So yes, it's a play and there's no end to the play. It's called Leela. And Leela can be played very joyfully once you cut the veil of ignorance called Maya. Maya is believing in perceptual magical lies. Everything you perceive is a magical lie. The only thing that's not a lie is the invisible formless undefined, infinite consciousness, which is modifying itself into these species-specific magical lies. Now, once you get that, then you want to play. Okay, now in, in the Vedanta, the end of this play is what we call Samadhi. Okay, transcendence, or they say no more recycling as, you know, biological organisms, you're done with karma, and, you're done with um, with um, the recycling, rebirth, and all that. I think you know that could be a, an endless, terminal, eternal boredom. 
Um, so I think once you actually rest in Samadhi, now you know that you can play. And Sankalpa is more important than a story. So the story is karma. My body is karmic story being projected out. And every, you know, if I close my eyes, all I can hear is stories. And pleasant stories can create uh, pleasant sensations and unpleasant stories can unpleasant sensations. But in the extreme, unpleasant and pleasant are the same sensation. You know, if, you, if you're exposed to extreme cold or extreme hot, you'll feel the same thing. Okay, extreme pleasure, extreme pain, same thing. But your interpretation is this is pleasurable, this is painful, and this is the karmic body. Behind the karmic body is there's a rainbow body, which is your mind, intellect, ego, and all the colors of the rainbow metaphorically expressing themselves as moods and emotions and thoughts and sensations and feelings. But behind the rainbow body is the bliss body, the formless body. And once you engage with the formless body, then you see that the rainbow body and the physical body and the physical world are projections of that. Now it's time to play because these infinite lokas are actually in your own being. They're not out there. Even God is in your own being, not out there. You know, soul is, you don't have awareness. You are awareness having these experiences. So is there an end? I hope not. I think, you know, if there's infinite lokas, I want to play in all of them. On that one, I mean, I kind of like the journey, actually. Yeah. And then there's deja vu. Right? <laughs> and then you're like, have I done this before? Why does this feel so normal? Right. Right. Exactly. Deja vu is, uh, you know, actually every experience is a deja vu. When I talk to you, by the time you hear my words, they're gone. So you're experiencing the past. When you look at me, by the time you recognize me, what you looked at is gone. So at all times, we are looking at an illusion. At all times, we are hearing illusions. They don't exist. Whatever you experience is gone. You know, I like to quote Wittgenstein, you know, we, our life is a dream. We are asleep. Once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we're dreaming. And that's where the fun starts. You mentioned a lot about karma, Deepak, and a lot of folks in East and the West have different interpretation. Here's mine. It's action, but what's your interpretation when you're performing those actions? Is it written with soul awareness, which has the intention of love, peace, purity, truth, and joy? Or is the action you're about to perform influenced by algae, anger, lust, greed, attachment, and ego. It's an acronym I use regularly. Would you say that the intricacies to why there seems to be a kumbhakarna mentality, which means everyone is so asleep in terms of understanding why we're here, why there's breath, is it all because of karma, that souls have been performing karmas maybe more in algae consciousness, so it's really separated the soul from its divinity. And the process of spirituality and research of oneself is to be able to begin to enjoy the coming together of your, your being and to bring it back into order where you, you just wake up in the morning and you look at the ceiling and life is good. Life is just good. Yeah, that's a beautiful description of karma. One other way to think of karma is it's your personal history that you identify with. And um, the word history means it's over, but it doesn't exist. Okay, so as long as we identify with something that doesn't exist, we are in karmic bondage. So, you know, and people talk about good karma, bad karma. Those are interpretations. You know, some people I know like to go to horror movies. The more they can experience the heebie-jeebies, the more they enjoy the movie. Some people like to go to comedies. Some people like to go to tragedies, etc. So it's all good. You know, it's all good. To transcend karma, all you have to do is replace it by kriya. Um, so, you know, if you close your eyes, I said, you'll experience your karmic body, which is a story. Now, let the story go, because whatever the story is, it is describing the past. It's not describing what's happening right now. Okay, and even what's happening right now is ungraspable. So we've identified, as I said, with threads of desire, wisps of memory, 
which are ungraspable, but we've been so diligent at it that we think we are squeezed into the volume of a body of the span of a lifetime. And then we think that's doomsday, right? But once you realize that it's all made up, then, you know, go beyond karma, just replace karma with kriya, which you just said, love in action is kriya. Or even a mantra is kriya, a sankalpa is kriya, a mahavakya is kriya. Going into pratyahara and looking at what's happening in your body and directing consciousness to shift change. All this is known. It's so beautifully known and practiced for thousands of years. But, uh, you know, we get stuck in these concepts, karma. There's no karma, just kriya. Attention, intention, and lightness of being, and Ishwar Paranidhana, surrender to the divine. Surrender to the divine mystery. Science is a great attempt to solve the mystery, but it is based on magical lies. Science is not, you know, all the big scientists I talk to, Nobel laureates, um, some, most of them have become scientists. You know, they're not scientists, they're apostles of scientism. Scientism is a religion, <laughs> just like <laughs> communism is a religion. <laughs> or, you know, so to be a true scientist is to know that I have a methodology, observation, validation, refutation, falsification, but even my methodology is very species specific. It gives me a, you know, everything you experience is less than 1% of what exists out there. So why do you have faith in science? I would rather not have faith in science other than it helps me to get on Zoom or it helps me to use this. Otherwise, <laughs> it, it doesn't tell me who I am or who or what is doing the science. I'm so with you right now. I get it. I can't believe we're coming to a close of our wonderful time together. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you the great Dr. Deepak Chopra, who lives a life of just simplicity and, and curiosity and, and, and love and, and exploration. What is the great awakening? What's the great awakening? For me, the proof of the great awakening would be a peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, joyful world and love not as a mere sentiment, but the ultimate truth at the heart of creation. You and Oprah Winfrey have hosted the popular 21-day meditation experience. It's to really help us to tap into our highest sense of consciousness. Can you leave us with three top tools that you could use for the support to help our viewers to tap into higher consciousness? Yeah. By the way, those meditations are now all on um, the Chopra app, which is a commercial app and a lot of it is free. So if anyone wants to engage on the Chopra app. So I think if you start your day every day with the following process, and I can ask everybody who's listening to us to just engage in that process. So wherever you are, sit quietly, close your eyes and uh, take a few deep breaths. And now bring your awareness to your heart. And let's just engage in a little uh, reflection, inquiry. So please uh, have your awareness in your heart and mentally ask yourself, who am I? Am I the changing body or am I the awareness in which the changing body is an experience? Am I the mind or am I the consciousness in which the mind is a changing experience? Don't try to answer the question, just ask the question. What am I? Who am I? Who is it? What is it that wants to know the answer? What is asking the question? Just leave it there. Second question, what is my deepest desire for myself and for my fellow sentient beings? Again, don't answer it. 
just be aware of any sensations, images, feelings, thoughts that may spontaneously arise or not arise. What is my deepest desire? Let's stay with that for a few seconds. What is my deepest desire? Third question. What is my purpose? What is my calling? In this moment in history, what is my calling? Again, not trying to answer it, but just be aware of any sensations, images, feelings, thoughts that may come. What is my purpose? What is my calling? Last question, what am I grateful for? Allowing any sensation, image, feeling or thought to come to you. This is the big one. This will open the door to existence. What am I grateful for? And now just rest in your own being, rest in your presence. Nothing to do. Just live those questions and life will move you into the answers. That's it. Thank you, Deepak. Um, wow. Isn't that nice? We should all live in that space, shouldn't we? Yes. It just seems so simple. World yeah. peace. No, World they peace say remembrance, good. remembrance is just remembering that which was dismembered. We don't need to learn anything. We just have to remember what we already know. Now, um, I know you've got your book out, Meta Human. How's that doing? And the I app? Did. Good, good. Glad Chab, to hear. App is doing good, Meta Human, Total Meditation. I'm doing a new book. This one year that I was in the pandemic, I decided to reinvent my body besides resurrecting soul. So I'm doing a yo basic yoga book right now with my yoga teacher. I'm very happy for you. Dr. Deepak Chopra, thank you so much for your time. It was well thank spent. You. Thank you, Sister Jenna. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Vani. Okay, everyone, I'm sure you must have taken so much from my time with Dr. Deepak Chopra. Again, I know I have. There are so many things I wanted to go back and even ask him about one of the concepts he mentioned about Maya. And I was going to ask him, tell me more about Maya, that whole energy of your past that keeps trying to sabotage your present moment. But he's left us with so much to think about. So what a great session with the wonderful Dr. Deepak Chopra. Thank you all so much Thank for you, listening. Sir.